kick off this event. Uh, first, I want to thank the, the firm Holland and Knight, particularly David, uh, you and the uh, Dulles Chamber for organizing this event. Uh, like I said, my name is Jan Mull. I'm the uh, uh, International Business Investment Manager for the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority, as well as the chairman for the International Business Council for the Dulles Regional Chamber. Uh, Korea is very near and dear to my heart for two reasons. I was myself once in Korea on a business trip, truly enjoyed it. And as many of you know, the Fairfax County EDA maintains an office in Korea since uh, 2005. Um, the theme for the International Business Council is being engaged in a global dialogue that during COVID was pretty challenging. And I fully realized that with people from Korea and even Singapore on the, on the, on the screen, it is the time difference is always a challenge, but therefore I'm really excited to, for seeing this great event. To start this event, I would like to give the mic to Ian Chun with the Metropolitan Washington Airport Authority to, uh, to tell us a little bit about how to travel back and forth to Korea. Ian, take it away. Thank you, Ian, and thank you to the Dulles Chamber for inviting me to join you today. Um, let me share my screen here, uh, and then we can get started. Um, so uh, an important thing when you're talking about business, of course, is the ease of travel and transit in between the, uh, the origins and destinations. Uh, we at the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority own and operate both Reagan National, which is our uh, domestic airport, as well as Dulles International, the global gateway to the Washington metropolitan area. The, as the Washington, D.C. area, uh, we have had nonstop flights between Washington, D.C. and, uh, and Seoul uh, since 2001, um, leading up into the COVID crisis, which, of course, interrupted many international flights. Um, we were at a daily year-round service with Korean Air, and due to COVID, there was a very brief time of interruption, um, only just from, from April to June of 2020. Currently, we have uh, restored service at uh, four flights per week, and the expectation is that um, that, that will restore to a uh, full daily service in the fourth quarter of this year. If you were to go online right now to look for those flights, uh, starting in October, you would find that daily service showing up. Um, as you see here in the flight table at the bottom, also our flights are at very convenient times of day. Uh, Jan already mentioned the time differences and flights to and from the East Coast to the US to Asia have a tendency to be at odd times of day, whereas our flights to Korea are not. Uh, you see here from Washington Dulles, you would depart at 1.25 in the afternoon and you would arrive at uh, 4.50 p.m. local time in Korea the following day. Uh, and vice versa, the return flight is also 10.25 in the morning, arriving here 11.25. So again, very convenient times, easy for le leisure, easy for doing business. Um, importantly as well, because of COVID, we know that there are constantly changing regulations. I do want to make everybody on this call aware that you know, testing is something that you should be constantly aware of those requirements as things are very fluid right now and changing. You know, check with the U.S. Embassy, check with the Korean Embassy as to what the requirements are and do check with your airline, not just at the time that you book, but also at the time you're getting ready to depart. If you do need a test and right now PCR testing is an expectation, there's plenty of places to get PCR tests in the D.C. area, but not only that, you can also get them at the airport. We actually have clinics uh, for PCR testing outside security at both Reagan National and Dulles International. They do need to send it to an off-site lab, so it does take uh, a day or two to get your results, but that still works within the very typical three-day window uh, very comfortably. Um, I will note our levels of international service. Uh, when COVID happened, only 13 airports in the United States were allowed to continue having international flights and Washington Dulles as the gateway to the nation's capital was one of them. Um, as you see here as well, um, I know that some of our panelists are not just from Korea, but also, um, you know, when we look at our general service to Asia, uh, our typical services are Beijing, Seoul and uh, Tokyo. So if there's anything that really shows how important of a partner uh, Seoul you know, and, and Korea is to us, is that one of only three direct services from, from Washington currently does fly to Korea. Uh, domestically as well, your partners in business may be coming from other parts of the United States and they can connect from any of you know, 99 different places to get to a, a flight to or from, um, from Korea, from Washington Dulles. And I will also note just in terms of your ease of getting around, when you do arrive here at Dulles, come, uh, come the first quarter of 2022, we will also be opening Metro to and from Dulles 
uh, you know, public transit gives you that ease of access, especially at that midday flight time. And it's through an underground tunnel. So it doesn't matter rain, shine, snow, what have you, you will be, be easily able to use this metro accessibility and get anywhere in the greater metro network around the Washington area very, very easily. Uh, in fact, you would be at Metro Center in just under one hour, 56 minutes, and you'd be just a couple blocks from the White House. And importantly, I know not everything is just about uh, moving people, but many of your businesses may also involve cargo. So cargo volumes, we do not have scheduled uh, air freight service uh, with a freighter. We usually do what's called belly cargo, which is that in the same aircraft that you would fly in as a passenger, the cargo storage area underneath would also be used for cargo. And here you see that. And that is why I'll point out the numbers in 2020 and the year to date in 2021 is on track uh, with 2020 because um, really this is, this is a reflection of how much the flight schedules were reduced due to COVID. We have an expectation that those cargo volumes will rebound as the number of flights are, uh, are in the process of rebounding. And I'm very happy to say that we are seeing that improvement go onwards and upwards. Um, so thank you very much for your attention this morning. At this point, um, I will hand it over to, uh, to David Cole, who will be the moderator for uh, your full discussion panel. Thank you. Good morning, uh, everyone here in the United States, and good evening to anyone joining um, in Korea. Uh, my name is David Cole, and I'm a partner with Holland and Knight, and it is our pleasure um, to co-host uh, this morning's event. Um, thank you very much, Jan. Um, thank you very much uh, for your um, discussion about the ease, Ian, of uh, travel between uh, Korea and the United States. I can attest uh, that everything that you said is true. I, I personally uh, travel between the United States and Korea at least three times a year. And um, the ease of travel between uh, Dulles and Incheon, uh, the airport outside of Seoul, is, is truly uh, very helpful in developing business relationships. So talking about business relationships, that's what we're going to talk about this morning on our panel. So if, if I might, let me take just a minute or two to introduce uh, everyone to our panel. Um, we're very, very pleased to have a, a very rich and vibrant uh, panel discussion today about uh, doing business in Korea as a US enterprise. Um, to help us uh, with our discussion, we have a number of lawyers from uh, the Korean law firm DR and Aju. DR is one of Korea's uh, top law firms uh, with over 209 uh, legal experts with extensive experience handling uh, Korean domestic uh, compliance and international uh, transactions and, and, and dispute resolution. They also represent Korean multinationals uh, overseas in banking, finance, M&A, real estate, construction, et cetera. And they're just a super law firm and one of our um, uh, favorite partners um, in Korea. <clears throat> um, also on the panel today is a serial entrepreneur, uh, Justin Yong. Uh, Justin, is a Singaporean uh, entrepreneur and has done business in multiple countries around uh, Asia uh, and is currently a situate in Korea and has established a number of businesses in Korea. And he is also the chairman of the Singapore Chamber of Commerce in Korea. And Justin will tell us a little bit about uh, some of the practical uh, issues that arise when a, uh, a non-Korean business is interested in expanding to Korea. Uh, from DR and Aju, we have a number of lawyers, uh, including uh, Mr. Sunny Im. Uh, Sunny is the co-chair of the International Practice Group at DR, and he focuses on cross-border uh, corporate transactions and uh, outbound investments. Uh, he focuses on M&A, and also does some dispute resolution too. And he's served as the uh, external counselor 
for the Ministry of Justice of Korea on international investment disputes since 2014. With Sonny is his partner, Tim Dickens. Uh, Tim is a British and South African attorney who joined uh, the firm in 2013 and is a partner in the international transactions team. He's chairman of the South African Chamber of Commerce in Korea and has been appointed as a counselor as well by the Ministry of Justice with respect to international transactions and other issues. Joining Tim and Sonny uh, is their partner, Soyun Yoon. Soyun uh, is a partner on Sonny's international transactions team, and she advises global companies and multinationals and foreign governments interested in entering the Korean market. Uh, she spends most of her time working on corporate compliance, foreign direct investment, commercial transactions, and helping companies understand compliance with Korean regulatory laws. Uh, Mr. Evan Lee uh, is on the panel as well and is a partner uh, at uh, DR and Anjou. And before joining DR and Anjou, he was a uh, legal manager at Vena Energy. That's a Singaporean renewable energy developer uh, and has also served as general counsel at a Korean pharmaceutical company, who wants, as well as being IP counsel at Hyundai uh, Motor Company. And uh, Yara uh, Ye Yeon is also a member of Sunny's team and uh, she's passed both the New York bar and the Korean bar, which is exceptional uh, in Korea. I have to emphasize how difficult it is to be able to pass both bars. Uh, so that's wonderful. And she works with Sunny on uh, cross-border transactions and the like. Uh, outside of the DR and Aju panelists, we have Joel Levin joining us. Joel is a commercial banker at HANA Bank in Seoul, where he's helped uh, U.S. and other companies enter Korea and establish banking relationships uh, in Korea for many, many, many years. And Joel has wonderful stories to tell us uh, about uh, multinationals entering uh, Korea. Uh, Caroline Chung uh, will join us as well uh, on the panel. Caroline uh, works with um, uh, the U.S. Department of Commerce's International Trade Administration, uh, uh, focusing on uh, commercial services. And she's, uh, she's a situate in Northern Virginia in Washington, D.C. And her portfolio includes a whole host of different issues, including uh, agribusiness and construction, education, and the like. Uh, she served in, uh, around the world in a number of posts. Uh, uh, including in Korea and in Kabul as well. Uh, her private sector experience includes working for a number of companies and Ms. Chung uh, holds uh, degrees from the University of Wisconsin and, and Vanderbilt. Finally, we have Han Suk Choi uh, joining us as well. Han Suk is uh, with Invest Seoul. Uh, he's an executive director there and Mr. Choi will tell us about uh, in, uh, opportunities uh, for investment in Korea. All right, uh, maybe 10 seconds about myself as well. So again, my name is David Cole, partner at Holland and Knight. Uh, I focus on M&A transactions, uh, securities offerings and finance transactions. I've closed billions and billions and billions of dollars of transactions uh, over the course of a 25 plus year career. Uh, been with Holland and Knight for more than uh, 10 years prior to that. I was with Baker and McKenzie, where I uh, traveled the globe doing all kinds of uh, cross-border uh, transactions. I've headed uh, the Korea practice uh, for Holland and Knight uh, for more than a decade. And it's just been my absolute pleasure uh, to work uh, between Korea and the United States, Korean culture is extraordinary and I'm really looking forward to helping US businesses um, learn a little bit about uh, Korea and its business culture and its business climate today. I hope you really enjoy uh, the panel. So what we thought we would do is we'll start uh, with a very short discussion about how US businesses uh, can enter uh, a, a new market overseas. And once we talk about that for just a couple minutes, we'll turn it over to the panel to explore the different ways that companies can enter the market 
and uh, the various uh, items uh, that you need to think about and prepare for uh, before you enter uh, the market. So let me just share my screen for a minute here. And we will pull up a really quick slide. Okay. So I hope everyone can see the slide. Sonny, if you can give me a thumb, thumbs up, tell me if you can see the slide. Excellent, super, thank you, Sonny. Okay, so for a US company, thinking about expanding its business globally, it needs to think about the relative uh, benefits of expanding overseas and compare that to the relative risks involved in expanding overseas. Risks in terms of both the time and the energy and the effort uh, and the expense to expand overseas, as well as uh, the potential uh, for contingent liabilities uh, overseas. So what we do is we help companies to think about balancing uh, the risks and, and, and the potential rewards. So that's what this slide is supposed to help us see a little bit. So on the far left-hand side of the slide, we talk about dipping your toes in the waters overseas. How do you do that? Well, you can just start, if you're a product manufacturer, for example, you can just start by exporting uh, products overseas and trying to develop a customer base in, in a country like Korea. Um, if, if you're successful uh, with that, you may want to engage with a commercial agent uh, in Korea. And we'll talk a little bit about that during the panel. Uh, with Soyun, she'll talk a little bit about engaging with commercial agents who are paid uh, a commission for helping you to um, uh, derive sales of your, of your products and services. Um, you may also find that it's uh, appropriate to engage with distributors uh, overseas and, and especially in Korea where they will uh, purchase your products from you and then resell them uh, for a product, uh, for a profit, excuse me. Um, if you're a technology company, you may engage in certain licensing transactions uh, overseas. And if all goes well with your uh, exporting and licensing, it may become time to start thinking about engaging in strategic alliances. And there are all kinds of different strategic alliances that companies may choose to engage in, including both non-equity strategic alliances where you're not really tying the knot, so to say, with anyone overseas, and equity uh, strategic alliances, which are your classic JVs or perhaps minority investments in other companies. Um, if you're thinking about a strategic alliance uh, and you wanna start um, more on the, on the technological side, perhaps non-equity side of the, uh, of the aisle, you can think about joint uh, research and development agreements, commercialization agreements, swapping technology, agreeing with others to promote uh, the further development of your technology. Uh, we see this all the time in the, in the pharmaceutical space. Um, we see production collaboration agreements where you might have co-packing arrangements with other companies uh, in your, in, in your um, jurisdiction of preference. Um, if you wish to form a, an equity uh, joint venture, it might look a little bit like this, where you and a, uh, a partner overseas form a new company together. And in our example here, we show the US company having majority control of the new uh, uh, joint venture, uh, which is often a Delaware uh, limited liability company because Delaware offers so much flexibility um, in the way that you can um, set up your, your joint ventures. And then perhaps we, for tax purposes, the JV owns an offshore uh, taxpayer, such as a, a Cayman Islands Corporation, uh, which then invests in, in the target company. And we'll talk about uh, during the course of the panel uh, whether you should engage with local representatives or not. It's optional in, in, in Korea. So uh, once you've had an opportunity to really uh, test the strength of your brand and your product, and your services in Korea, it may be time for you to really start um, uh, putting some 
uh, very material investment in Korea. How would you do that? Well, you have basically two choices. You could do uh, uh, foreign direct investment in Korea through a greenfields operation where you basically go in and set up shop. You're not partnering uh, with anyone else. You're not buying another company. You're simply taking your company, your brand and creating uh, a new branch of that, of that company uh, in Korea. You're buying the real estate. You're, in, you're employing people directly there. And we're gonna talk a lot with the DR and Anjou folks about how to go about doing that. And then of course you can do what we do, which is you can go into Korea and you can find a good company that you believe in and, uh, and go through an M&A transaction uh, with them where, where that company becomes perhaps a subsidiary uh, of your mother company back in, in, in the United States. Obviously the Greenfields investments and the M&A transactions are over on the right-hand side of our slide because they represent uh, both sort of the most material investment that you might make uh, in, in Korea, but also provide for you the opportunity for the greatest uh, rewards. So I'll stop there for just a moment. Um, I wanna encourage everyone um, uh, participating and listening uh, to our discussion today to ask questions, raise your hand on the, on the webinar, and we'll be very, very happy to stop and take any questions that anyone uh, might have. So if anyone has any questions about uh, the slide and, and what we're talking about here, go ahead and, and, and ask. If not, we'll, we'll get started with the panel. Okay, well, let's, let's get started. So let me ask Sunny, um, if you could tell us a little bit about um, how important it is when entering the Korean market to think first and foremost, perhaps, not about your product and your service and what you want to accomplish in Korea, but maybe think of first and foremost about how important it is to meet the right people first in Korea and make the right relationships and where those relationships need to be and the different types of people that you need to, to, to meet in, in Korea. Um, so that the, the more work that you do ahead of time in, in developing these relationships, might help you save time, money, and energy down, down the road. So Sonny, maybe you could comment a little bit about that. Sonny, can you hear us? Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> In Korea, before you enter into Korea, right, one of the biggest uh, the most important thing of all is you need to find a right local intermediary. In other words, uh, in Korea, if you were to start everything from the scratch, it's extremely difficult because cold calls rarely work in Korea. So finding a good local intermediary is highly recommended. And there was one occasion where there was a Singaporean franchisor uh, they wanted to set up a joint venture company in Korea together with a reputable Korean target. They made many, many attempts to have a meeting with, uh, let's say, decision makers, but all of which were sort of blocked by uh, gatekeepers within the company. So finally, they came to us through the assistance of our managing partner we were able to have them have a meeting with the decision makers within the Korean target. Yes, it's true they did not form a joint venture, but at least the client was very happy just because they were able to do uh, you know, meaningful and proper discussion with the uh, decision makers within the Korean target. So if you were to think about uh, investing into Korea. If you wanted to find a right partner in Korea, uh, try to rely upon a professional uh, company like us, and then we should be able to connect you to the right partner in Korea. That's super sunny. Um, so a lot of companies uh, have already tested the Asian markets 
um, over the years, and many companies have tried to enter China. And a lot of companies have experienced some difficulty entering mm -hmm. uh, China and the Chinese markets um, for many reasons. But one of the reasons most articulated to us as lawyers um, in the United States is the difficulty in, in working in China because you're required it is mandatory in China to uh, establish your business through a local partner. And that local partner has to not only share in the um, setup of the business and the operations of the business, but it has an economic interest in that business as well. And many, many U.S. companies find that very challenging. Can Sonny, can you and your team tell us a little bit about uh, whether or not it's mandatory in Korea to have a local partner and how, uh, the, how it's different between uh, Korea and, and China with regard to that? You know, in Korea, right? Uh, when you, if you were to make an investment in Korea, right? You don't really have to have a joint venture partner. Therefore, you, you are able to form a 100% owned subsidiary. But there are many foreign investors who would actually prefer to have a joint venture partner just because uh, they wanted to have a local partner who understands the market. So the situation in China may be unique because uh, I do have an experience in Dubai where uh, if you were to make an investment into Dubai, you have to have a local Emirati having some shares within uh, in the company. And then you actually have to pay that. But uh, that's not the situation in Korea. You are free to have a 100% owned subsidiary. But Yera should be able to explain to you, uh, there are certain industry where we do have restriction on foreign ownership. So Yera, can you please elaborate on this? Yeah, sure. So we don't have that many restricted industries that limit foreign investment in Korea, but we do have like certain industries that we try to protect uh, the market. Um, actually, we categorize like certain industries by uh, Korean law. So it doesn't it doesn't mean that your specific industry or sector or line of business that um, investors in the U.S. Uh, categorize themselves will fall under the same category as we uh, categorize them. But uh, the foremost important uh, thing is that we, the part that we restrict like 100% is related to the national system. So it doesn't specifically mean that it's commercially important to the U.S. investors. So for example, like legislative systems or administrations or just, uh, justice systems. Those are the specific sectors that we uh, pr uh, protect 100%. Um, but the, the sectors that we restrict partially, such as like below 50% or below 30% are related to, first of all, agriculture, like crop growing or beef cattle raising. And second thing, uh, I can give you an example of um, nuclear power generation or hydroelectric power generation. All those uh, power generation related sectors are also uh, somewhat restricted. And also uh, broadcasting industries such as media business, uh, like um, let's say radio communication or cable broadcasting, those sectors are also somewhat restricted uh, to, the, to below 50%. And transportation system is also restricted uh, to, uh, to the foreign investors uh, below 50%. So these are the examples. And as we were talking about um, comparison between Chinese um, business environment, I would like to mention that uh, one of the biggest reason for having local partner in chi China is because of its uh, in transparency, because it's not transparent as much as uh, we are in Korea and overall credibility of the society system is uh, less credible compared to Korea. So I think considering uh, these instability and 
in transparency, even though we have certain restrictions in, in terms of foreign restriction, uh, foreign investment, uh, these are commercially, I think, uh, less important um, when, when you I, considering your industries that you're doing in, in the US. That's wonderful. Thank you, Yara. Um, so it sounds to me, Yara, like if you're a, a technology company, right. um, or you're a service provider, or you're a product manufacturer, you're not really going to um, have any uh, difficulty with these local laws. They're, those local laws are, are developed at protecting uh, the food supply in Korea exactly. and the energy supply and things of that nature. But general yes. businesses probably will not encounter those types of restrictions. Is that fair? Yes. If okay. that's directly connected to like social system or social structure, SOC, if, if your industry is not specifically or directly related to that specific industries, then it's safe to say that your investment will be uh, be possible up to like 100%. Okay, that's wonderful. Justin, Justin, so you're a serial entrepreneur. Your business is starting businesses and uh, you've had the great fortune and, and pleasure to start businesses around the world. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what it was like for you to start a business in Korea as a non-Korean person. Sure thing. Um, thanks, David. So I've actually had the experience of starting businesses in the Philippines. Uh, I've actually dipped my hand with a partner in China even. So maybe um, I'll start off with like what you were mentioning. Uh, trying to start a business in, in China is, uh, is a, a very unique thing in the sense that if you do not have relationships there, if you do not know somebody of influence or you do not partner with a partner that is able to get things done, there is going to be a lot of um, issues for you, right? There are a lot of things you cannot get done. Simply because I think like what Yara said, there is um, very much a lack of, I guess, jurisdiction and structure there. Right, you can get things done when you have influence. If I had to compare it with what I did when I started five years ago, starting with Korea, in fact, five years ago, I would say compared to Korea now, Korea was a little bit less structured even. I, I, I would venture to say that. But now in, in, in the recent five years, I've seen them advance so much um, such that when you have a relationship here, right, uh, being able to expedite everything you do. Just because you know someone, you have an agency, you get, uh, you get very much far ahead. Five years ago, if I had knew this knowledge, um, I would have been able to expedite whatever I did, maybe by 50%, right? It took me so long just to get everything done, right? The good thing is that I was still able to get it done. Uh, there was a structure. I was able to move step by step, but the process became so slow and sluggish. And then now after five years being here, I, you know, I learned my mistake. I knew that it could be done so much faster. In fact, my second business, which I started last year, you know, I, I did it in probably um, less than 25% of the time I did with my first business. So you know, just having those relationships, just knowing who to turn to, and then being able to have um, this agency and, and people you know to rely on will help you expedite that whole process so much faster. Yeah. So Justin, that question. Justin, maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, what it takes uh, to develop uh, your brand um, in, a non, in your non-home market. I mean, people know your brand back in Singapore. For many on, on this webinar, they have uh, develop their brand here in the United States, whether it's a product or a service, people know them. They enter into Korea and they need to develop that brand there as well. Tell us a little bit about what it takes to develop your brand in Korea. Korea is a very, um, it's a very unique market and everything moves really fast, right? Um, what I have experienced over the last five years is that uh, being able to make your product something that is trendy these days is very, very important. Meaning 
um, whoever is able to latch on your product, right? Being able to share it on social media is the best thing. Being able to let people feel that, you know, if I am engaging with your brand and your product means I am in the in crowd, right? That's a very huge thing here because once that happens, everybody basically sources you out. And uh, if you are part of that trend that is happening in Korea at that period of time, I would say your business would be ridiculously awesome because uh, if I run back to what I run, right? Five years ago when I started, I was the first business to bring in an escape room in Korea, right? Before that, there were no escape rooms in Korea at all. Um, but I came in at a time, I managed to get a trend going and I literally had long queues outside my, my shop, right? And from then on, everybody started to create their own escape rooms, right? And that's going to happen with any kind of business and industry. But being able to first get people to know what this new thing is, and then the, especially the younger generation to be able to share it, it immediately goes viral. And anything that goes viral locally in terms of, you know, as of now, it's Instagram is the biggest thing. In fact, Facebook is dropping off. So if you want to come in here, look at the types of social media they are using now and focus very strongly on that because the second you are able to tap on that and you put your resources there, right? That's going to help your brand really grow, right? That's based on my own personal experience. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about, um, you know, the Korean um, market in terms of its... Um, uh, how attuned it is to, to technology and how highly educated uh, the Korean market is. Have you, have you ever struggled to find the most highly qualified people uh, to employ in your business? And, and do they surprise you with their uh, technological skills and, and prowess? Um, okay, hiring in Korea is a very unique area, I would say. Um, a lot of the local talent, all the, the really smart people in the high universities, the, the, the best graduates, Kamalade, Somalade, what they are basically aiming to do is to join the large companies, the Chaebols, right? So if you are looking to target those really at the top, you probably won't have that option. There, Two things they think of is one is they want to jump to a big, huge company and start off, right? So they're probably not going to think about, you know, if you are a medium-sized company. But if you want to then venture into say, you know, I, I'm, if you, I'm, I'm that kind of person that's looking to get out of Korea, right? Maybe to explore international markets. Then getting that talent is easy because there's this good handful and niche group of people that know that they, they probably don't want to stay in Korea, right? They want to advance to different cultures. They want to have a different kind of a, a setup within the corporate world. And then it's easy to get those people, right? And I would say that based on the knowledge, I mean, compared to Singapore and Korea, they are quite similar in terms of capability. But um, in terms of technology specifically, right? Knowing how to, uh, the cutting edge technologies and things that are happening now, I would say that Korean market and the Korean um, graduates actually have an age over Singapore. Right? I would say Singapore is more into overall business. Whereas if I look at the Korean market, they, you know, if I compare te specific technological aspects, right, the Korean graduates and Korean market, the, the working personnel, they have a better grasp on that. Super. Well, I think that's a wonderful segue to bring uh, Tim Dickens into the conversation. Uh, Tim, uh, Justin was talking about the Chables. Um, <laughs> maybe you could just help us to understand who the Chables are. I think everyone in the U.S. knows who they are, but they may not have heard the expression Chable before. Um, but maybe you can also help the people um, uh, in the United States understand how large the Korean middle market is and how vibrant that Korean middle market is and what kind of um, opportunities uh, exist 
for U.S. businesses in various sectors, whether it's energy, life sciences, manufacturing, uh, to work with the Korean middle market as well? Sure. Thank you, David. And good morning to everyone and good evening to everyone in Korea. So that's a really good question. In, in terms of the chebos, I, I think you'd all be very familiar with, with what it is. That basically is the sort of the traditional big companies, which are sort of originally uh, family run. So the sort of Samsungs, the Lottes, um, the Kia, Hyundai, et cetera. And I think for the size of Korea in terms of, you know, large companies and chebos, it's quite fantastic and amazing in terms of how many of these companies will be at the tips of your fingers. If you walk into, I guess, any U.S. store, you'll see the Samsung products, the LG products. Um, but over and above that, if one looks then um, in terms of, let's say, the energy sector, for example, I think the Samsungs, again, the LGs, the Poscos, the Deo, um, they have a great reputation in terms of um, project work, which they do do. So that includes infrastructure, uh, the energy, the energy sector. Uh, and I think they've made huge strides in the last sort of 20 to 30 years in terms of A, the reputation and B, the quality of work which they do put in. So I think the chebels speak for themselves and they do carry a lot of power um, within the country in terms of the, the sort of finances and, and what they bring in in terms of, in terms of revenue, uh, not only in Korea, but also in, in large portions of Southeast Asia. For example, in, in Vietnam, where you've got you know, I guess 20 to 30 percent of, of Vietnamese sort of GDP is, is on the back of, of Samsung generated um, chips uh, and LCD screens in, in that area. Um, for U.S. brands to sort of tie in, I, I think traditionally Korea and, and America have had fantastic relationship. And of course, I think U.S. brands carry a lot of weight in terms of um, the confidence which the consumers have on this side. Um, and as Justin sort of mentioned I think Korea in general is, is very brand sensitive and quite luxury orientated. Uh, so it is a super trendy area. I think they also refer to Korea as one of the sort of super trends. So a lot of the, the large luxury brands sort of test their products out in Korea and sort of do it over a sort of month or two month period to see this sort of reaction. And then if it's positive, they'll then use that for the, for the, rest, of, um, for the rest of the world. Um, I'd like to just touch on this sort of the SMEs and sort of the middle market. And I think this is an area where there definitely is an, a hotspot for particular investors that are coming in to Korea uh, to have a look at this area because these are companies that are not particularly in the, the focus or the limelight, so to say, but have a lot of potential. And I've just pulled off the, um, the Korean ministry website today for, for, for example, the first quarter of 2021. I think the, the investments into SMEs and middle-sized companies for the first quarter of 2021 came up to a record. It's the record ever in Korea, which is 1.24 trillion for the first quarter. And I think that gives a huge indication as to you know, the amount of money that is available and has been invested into um, companies into Korea just for this year. Uh, in particular, if you break it down by industry, um, for the first part of this uh, year, it was distribution and service industry, uh, ICT, so internet uh, communications technology. And I think it's quite well known that Korea itself is, is expanding incredibly in terms of the, I guess, the financial tech, so the fintech market and the gaming market. Um, and then the sort of third sort of category that came in in terms of investment was the bio and medical field. So you know, these are the sort of the hot markets in Korea at the moment. And I, I think there's a huge potential for, for investors that are looking to come in to sort of partner up with these or to look for, for investment um, opportunities. To tie in with Justin's point that he made um, to say that sort of in the last five years, things have significantly got better in Korea. And I 100% agree with that. I think um, if one looks at even for the startup uh, budget, which the government has allocated, it's now up to about 900 billion Korean won, and that's doubled in the last four years. And I think it just, it's the mindset that has also led the government to sort of make investment easier and also given opportunities in terms of financing and, and funds available for, for these sort of smaller markets rather than the big ones. So I think from a perspective from, from companies in the US that want to come in, um, have a look at not just the tables, but have a look at these mid sort of size companies where there is fantastic opportunity. That's super. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, what I'd like to do is pause for just a moment. We have a question uh, from Lafayette Barnes, who's the president and CEO 
of Zulu Global Enterprise, um, which is a B2B company based uh, here in, in Washington, DC. And Lafayette asks about the US Buy America program and whether it affects um, uh, South Korea and the importation into the United States of South Korean manufactured goods. So um, Lafayette, uh, at Holland and Knight, we are um, trade counsel to the government of Korea. And we are also trade counsel to a number of Korean companies that are facing this type of question uh, every day. Um, I'm an M&A lawyer, I'm not a trade lawyer, um, but I can tell you a little bit about how there are two statutes in the United States, the Buy America Act and the Buy American Act that both affect the importation of goods into the United States if those goods are going to be used for US government projects. So if there's, there's going to be a very large infrastructure uh, bill uh, coming down the pike with under President Biden's administration, uh, Korean steel manufacturers that we are working with are anticipating that. And I would not be surprised to find a lot of Korean manufacturers uh, setting up relationships with US companies in order to um, uh, improve their opportunity to sell their goods um, uh, for these types of in infrastructure projects. But what I'd like to do is throw that out to the panel. And if anyone on the panel would also like to comment about um, their experiences working with the, the Buy America program in the United States, please do. Okay, so Lafayette, if you'd like to follow up with us um, after the webinar, we'd be happy to talk to you about, about that further. Okay, well, uh, Tim, thank you very much for uh, the discussion about the Korean middle market. I think that it's extremely helpful to US businesses to understand that there's so much more to Korea uh, beyond the LGs and the Samsungs and the Hyundais of the world. Um, uh, David, maybe, David? Maybe, Yes, I'm sorry. If I may, there's another question being raised to Yera. Go uh, ahead, Sonny. Yeah. So okay. K Park asked the question, uh, what, what's it like uh, the restriction level in financial sector? And um, I actually sent them a message, uh, but um, I just answered that. The, the financial sector is not uh, restricted just because the investor is a foreigner, uh, but if, if not related to the central banking system or agriculture and fishery uh, banking. And one good thing about the Korean market is that it has a strong foreign investor protection policy and the national treatment is one of that policy. So if the, even if the investor is a foreigner, if, if the investor follow the um, Korean regulation properly, then there'd be no problem at all. Uh, but one thing that uh, the foreign investors have to expect is uh, there will be some regulations uh, in relation to the foreign exchange. So when the foreign investors try to bring in any uh, dollar amount or foreign uh, exchange amount into the Korean market, they have certain uh, report re reporting restrictions. I mean, uh, reporting obligations, but there's no specific uh, restrictions in relation to uh, how much equity uh, the foreign investor can have in certain uh, banking system or financial systems. Super. I, I, will, I will add into that question um, um, as um, panelists from HANA Bank that um, we, have, we have received more increasing number of inquiries about from financial companies, um, their interest in Korea is growing. And although it had generally been um, a fairly restricted sector, uh, the government has been has been easing those uh, those restrictions little by little over the past five five years or so. There's there's actually a, a ladder step process for uh, for doing so. So we're definitely seeing more uh, more opportunity for for the financial sector. Although it is it is generally subject to great 
number of regulations. And so legal counsel is highly recommended uh, even more so than in other sectors, I would say. And I, I think I can uh, tell you about this a little bit more. Uh, depending on the, the sector, actually there is a required investment. Like for example, just normal banking system, it required a 30 million US dollar as a foundation capital. And there is equity regulation about this. So it is not easy to tell you about this uh, in detail. But Mr. Choi, it, yeah. are, are what you're talking about is establishing uh, a bank in Korea. Yeah, it is just a, yeah example yeah. of the financial service. Yeah. So like a bank, depending on the financial service, each of them have a required investment. So yeah. if Joel... Uh, if, a, if a U.S. company on the, on the line today is not really interested in starting a bank mm, in yeah, Korea, mm -hmm. but is just looking for financing to help mm. expand its manufacturing or its services business uh, in Korea, uh, Joel, as a representative of Hana Bank, which is one of the largest banks in all of Korea, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your job and what you do to help uh, non-Korean companies um, establish banking relationships um, in Korea and how they go about uh, getting uh, commercial sources of, of, of uh, capital. Certainly, thank you, David and uh, DR and Aju and everyone else for organizing this uh, wonderful cross-Pacific uh, cross seminar. Um, as HANA Bank has uh, perhaps the largest international footprint among Korean banks and also a very uh, long heritage as Korea's leading foreign exchange and um, kind of uh, international bank. We've been supporting, supporting and uh, facilitating foreign direct investment uh, for as long as it's been around. And it really, it really picked up after the IMF crisis when Korea really um, opened the doors to foreign investment, which we, have, which we often refer to as FDI. Um, overall, US firms have been doing very well. Um, we have the US Chamber of Commerce, uh, AmCham without a doubt um, has several hundred active members strongly campaigning for American firms. Uh, we have big companies like Corning, who are working closely with Samsung and LG. Um, so I, I'd like to um, just briefly mention that we have, we can divide the US firms into like the very large multinationals, uh, listed companies that are very well established here, uh, like HP, Amazon, then we have a wide range of mid-sized companies, such as microchip suppliers um, from Silicon Valley, and the smaller ones that have been emerging lately, more of supplying the conglomerates and, and other large US companies. Um, forgive me, David, can you, can, you repeat your, um, can you repeat your key question there? Sure, sure. Well, let's take your example of the smaller companies that are looking to become part of the supply chain in Korea. Yes. There are plenty of U.S. companies that may have um, an important product or a technology or a service, too, for that matter, that might be very helpful uh, to the Korean middle market companies. Those companies that, that Tim were talking about, whether they're fintech companies, gaming companies, other technological companies, pharmaceuticals, whatever. Tell us a little bit about how those companies looking to enter into the Korean market at that level uh, could come to a bank such as yours and, and seek your guidance and your assistance for helping them to obtain the working capital that they may need um, in order to set up shop uh, in Korea. Certainly. So. So Korea has developed the um, foreign, invest, foreign direct investment uh, framework, which is very favorable, um, which has some minimum investment 
cap equity injection of around 100 million won, about a $100,000 to set up an entity. As was mentioned earlier, unlike in China, uh, US, US firms can go all out on their own, set up an entirely independent domestic entity here in Korea, or they may choose to partner uh, to go in in a joint venture with, uh, with, a, with a Korean company, perhaps take advantage of their more established um, network. So our bank and we have actually a, an established team um, which works, we ideally, ideally we work with the potential investor even when you're considering uh, Korea. So you'll be evaluating the market, you'll, you'll be looking at many of the factors that's, that have been discussed today, such as amazing um, adaptability, openness to new ideas, um, government supports it in, in the uh, free economic zones and other, uh, other incentives. And once that decision is made, or then even from that point on, you can approach uh, a bank such as ours through relationship managers um, in, you know, such as myself. And first we'll advise you on what type of entity you can set up, the pros and cons of those entities. Then we'll move to the very uh, important um, filing all the, docu the, the documentation, the notification of investment. So documentation is still fairly heavy. Um, and if you go at it yourself, uh, it's, it, could be, it could be taxing, could be trying, but having a solid bank support on your side will, will definitely ease that, um, that capital injection. That's, that's a liquidity injection, which generally will come from, your, from a parent company. And um, so we'll, we'll make sure it goes as fast and as effortless as possible. That's, that's, that's the first stage. In that's the second great. Stage, oh, I'm sorry, Joel, go ahead. Yeah. Yep. In the second stage, we'll basically proceed to flesh out your, your banking portfolio, uh, the types of accounts needed, uh, what's called a CMS or cash management services, which are essentially digital, um, digital banking services. What's unique about uh, banks like ours is we have enabled the parent company, if they wish, to maintain control, authority over, over banking services, or up to their extent needed to uh, enable the domestic team uh, to to take control. What, what I want to emphasize here is that it's a staged process at the early, early stage with very few, with perhaps with fewer people on the ground, um, you will want to um, have a US company stay in control. Uh, you may then want to have uh, a, proxy, uh, a proxy firm such as an esteemed law firm to manage uh, accounts for a while until you uh, adequately set up your own team. Secondly, of second importance, David, I think, is the second source of, of, of it, capital, which will come in the form usually of an intercompany loan. Um, this is where we can also come into, come into uh, play in terms of help with the uh, hedging, in terms of foreign exchange hedging, which, uh, which we are quite capable at. As, as Korea's leading uh, foreign exchange bank. And then we can move into other, other, for, other sources of financing, such as what, what we call in Korea, the minus or overdraft lines of credit. These are a little different from the US products. These are more um, one day, two day, very uh, short term loans. Um, and then we call it, you may know it as an overdraft line of credit. So, That's there, there are, these are the, the building blocks to help, help you get uh, establish your foundation and in the early stages when you need capital uh, processed across the border. Korea is again, highly regulated still. And so it helps to have knowledgeable, uh, knowledgeable professionals on the legal and banking side uh, to smooth the way. 
That's super. Um, Joel, thank you so much. Um, Mr. Choi, um, maybe you, you are the executive director of Invest uh, Soul. Um, maybe you could take a, a, a little bit of time and help um, the folks here in the United States to understand a little bit about the opportunities uh, that await them uh, if they are interested in um, moving overseas to Seoul. Um, primarily, maybe you could tell us a little bit about you know, the market itself, the size of the market. I don't think many people in the United States recognize that you know, when you fly into Seoul, you're flying into a city of 20 million people. Uh, much larger than the size of New York City, for example. It's an amazing, amazing market uh, in Seoul. And uh, uh, Joel was just talking about some of the uh, sources of debt capital, but maybe you could help uh, explain a little bit about um, uh, grants, uh, equity investments, tax incentives, and all those other things that might attract a U.S. business to to uh, lay down roots in Seoul. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, it is not easy to explain those things at once because the incentives, like for example, incentives, it is kind of negotiable depending on the size of the investment and number of employees. It is very different, even tax exception. City government provide a local tax exception, but anyway, there is a requirement. Uh, like for example, the city government, so uh, metropolitan government has a kind of two steps of incentives for foreign investors. Uh, one of them is for kind of reimbursement. All foreign direct invested company, they can reimburse uh, uh, some money the company already spent, like for example, legal fee, a part of a rental, and some others. Even it is uh, uh, different depending on the size of the investment. And the other incentives, uh, it is run by the metropolitan government directly, like for example, if the company have more than 100 employees and there is a HR subsidy. And depending on the business, sometimes the city government designate the area as a free economic zone. Then the company in that area can get kind of a tax exception. So it is not easy to tell you about this at once in the law, but after this webinar, if anyone interested in this, I can send you kind of a document. Then you can see the detailed information. That's wonderful, Mr. Choi. Thank you very much. I think the message to US businesses um, is that there are plenty of um, opportunities uh, to expand uh, into Korea. And uh, if you work with the right um, uh, people like yourself, there could be opportunities for uh, tax incentives, um, uh, and, uh, and payroll uh, reduction opportunities and other grants and the like. So um, we encourage everyone to reach out to you and, and to anyone on the panel um, uh, for help in that regard. Um, I'd like to ask Caroline a little bit about um, uh, how folks here in the United States can also help U.S. business concerns that want to reach out overseas. Mr. Choi is in Seoul, and he's, he can help people uh, with the incentives that he just discussed. But Caroline, um, how can uh, folks like yourself and, and the organizations that you work with help U.S. companies uh, to open doors uh, in Korea, whether it's through uh, U.S. government uh, uh, agencies, the U.S. Embassy in Seoul, private organizations, uh, what, what would you recommend U.S. businesses do uh, here to help expand their business overseas? 
So thanks very much for the question and thanks for allowing me to chime in um, regarding how uh, the federal government and our ecosystem um, can support American businesses who wish to export their goods or services overseas. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about Korea, and I'm brought on today uh, kindly by you because I serve there. And so I saw um, businesses come in uh, through uh, the, the channels in our ecosystem, the distribution channels in our ecosystem. So um, the way the federal government works is um, supposed to be extremely organic to um, an American company who um, is just starting out or, and, or has a nice reputation here, has built up their brand. Someone was mentioning that already um, about building up their brand domestically. And then all of a sudden, um, after months and months and months of research, they decide that Korea is the market for them or they've gotten some demand from the Korean market uh, because um, some influencer on social media was um, excited to use their product and then it went viral. And so now there's an e-commerce channel that has um, evolved or um, been created. Uh, and so if that channel has not been opened, that is where we are able to support the growth of a small to medium sized enterprise. Um, we can talk about companies that are a little bit more, and you've already done so, and the rest of the panel has already done so, bigger companies who are um, who already have the cash flow and are looking to make sizable investments into Korea, while we can support that, I really actually just want to focus on the small to medium sized enterprises. Anyone from I'm working out of my garage and I have a great business plan and I think Korea is my next market to uh, someone who has built their brands year over year, their, their revenues have increased and um, they are just seeking um, a new channel. Um, I actually have here, and I saw the participant list, um, part of the ecosystem with which the uh, federal government uh, works very closely, the Virginia Economic Development Partnership and the Small Business Development Centers. So all three of us, three organizations can help a small to medium sized enterprise go anywhere from, I want to create an international marketing plan or a business development plan all the way up to, um, I really think that my product and service can go into Korea and in the, in the Korean market, what do you recommend? And everyone um, on your panel has said the exact same thing, which is you have to establish relationships and you have to establish partnerships in country um, in order to um, make yourself success, especially if you don't have a lot of cash flow to begin with your small business, you can't afford um, to, to make um, extraneous decisions. The, the decision you make to go into a country with an airline ticket and a, and a flight over there and hotel, that's, that's a huge investment for you. So if that is the case, then um, the VDP, um, the Small Business Development Center and uh, the commercial service work very closely together to help find and execute your partnerships and establish your, your relationships. And I think the most important word I can, I can use here is trust. Uh, because you don't want someone who is going to uh, take your baby, uh, which is your business that you've worked so hard on and, uh, and run. You want to be able to stand on the shoulders of um, uh, Ellen Meinhardt, who is here, one of my colleagues uh, from the Virginia Economic Development Partnership or the US Embassy, which is where I worked uh, because the commercial service is located in 80 embassies all over the United States, just to be able to bring in American companies. Um, and in, in their various stages um, to, to uh, find trustworthy, reputable partners who can, uh, who understand exactly what your brand is, exactly what your company is, and exactly how to market it in country so that hopefully both of you sign an agreement and you're skipping down profit lane and prosperity lane. So that's, that's just a little bit of a start, um, but I'm, I'm happy to take uh, further questions from there. That's great, Caroline. Thank you. Um, what I'd like to do is, is ask you, Caroline, and, and maybe Soyun together to comment on sort of the way that you see uh, U.S. businesses organizing themselves. Uh, once they make that critical decision, they say, okay, we want to go to Korea. Um, 
how do they go about organizing themselves, um, uh, both from a practical standpoint, I'd ask you, Caroline, that, and then from a legal perspective, uh, Soyun, maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, some of the different ways that a business can structure itself from a corporate perspective. The business that is ideal for um, the Korean market or that is ready to go overseas in general has already uh, structured itself well for, um, for export. So um, the ideal, Korea is not a first entry to exporting market. It is, it takes time. There's a language barrier. There are cultural barriers. There are, um, it's an incredibly fast paced and high technology world that is uh, moving at a pace that may not be ready for your company um, or that your company may not be ready for. So uh, the companies that I see coming through that are actually ready and are structured well um, are already um, successful in exporting to uh, to easier markets such as Canada, uh, where there's uh, a nice free trade agreement, and then they move from free trade agreement to free trade agreement. So um, the uh, the United States has already established a beautiful uh, free trade agreement with Korea, where 95% uh, of tariffs have been eliminated, and um, there will be um, even more uh, credit depending on the actual um, the actual industry or the actual sector that the American company um, specializes in. So um, structurally, um, there's we as the federal government allow a company. We meet them where they are. We meet them where they are. And if they're not going to be successful in the Korean market based on our assessment, which it, which takes, it's incredibly transparent. It's go on to trade.gov and at three in the morning with your big socks, you know, and looking um, at all of the research tools and the top markets that uh, your company, um, that your company specializes in and see if Korea is an ideal market for you. And then we can go into customized market research for you. We can do counseling sessions for you. We make those assessments and you organize um, very little. You should already be ready to meet a new partner. Um, legally, um, the idea is that your Korean partner, after, you after we have vetted five different partners for you um, will be uh, the one that will take you through the landmines and actually light the path for you towards uh, making sure you don't, um, you don't stumble. So our motto truly is don't organize yourself. You really need um, a partner to be able to help you organize coming into Korea or any other market uh, and that you're not left alone. All right, super. Thank you, Caroline. So Soyun, um, mm -hmm. You know, assuming the, that the U.S. company has done its homework, as Caroline advises, mm -hmm. and it's ready to enter the Korean market, can you tell us a little bit about um, the different choices uh, mm -hmm. that a U.S. company has when entering uh, the Korean market in terms of yeah. uh, organizing itself from a corporate law perspective? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Car Caroline and David. So from the legal perspective, we usually give three options. First of all, if you are not yet ready for any commercial business, if you'd like to sound out that uh, local market in Korea first, then the first option is that you should set up a liaison office in Korea, which is purely for non-commercial activities, such as researches and marketings and any um, studies in Korea. But if you are ready to go for some commercial activities in Korea, then two uh, possible scenarios is that you can set up a branch. And in case of branch, it's more about um, branch of the head office in the United States. So the branch would be subject to your own articles of incorporation in the United States and also the governing law of that state. And, and in the meantime, the third option would be the joint uh, stock company or limited liability, which would be a subsidiary to your company in the States. So whereby um, if you have any partner, if you are in, like inclined to set up any joint venture in Korea, then that joint uh, stock company or a limited liability company or a limited company could be an option instead of a branch. But if you'd like to um, keep that uh, governance system of that Korean uh, legal presence, be 
completely under your uh, control, then a branch could be also a nice way. But these should be also considered based upon like your needs in Korea and what you are trying to do in Korea and what kinds of corporate governance you are inclined to uh, obtain in Korea. So uh, these issues should be monitored and discussed in depth before you decide which entity type you'd like to set. So Soyun, mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, uh, understanding that the various tax consequences of, of your choice mm -hmm. um, is very important. Um, would you have a, a, an opportunity to just tell us a little bit about um, how tax drives the choice in Korea? And then maybe we can talk just for a minute or so, not only about how you get your money into Korea, but most importantly, you know, assuming that our, our business is going to be very successful in Korea, we've now generated uh, earnings and profits, and we want to repatriate those earnings and profits back to the United States. Could, can you or, or others from your team uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, how one goes about repatriating those funds and whether there are Korean legal uh, requirements that one must, has, one must have to comply with to repatriate? Uh, funds back to the United States. So um, any, uh, any repatriation of earnings back to the state should be subject to the initial notification. Once you set up the company, you should notify as jo Mr. Joel Levin earlier mentioned that well, any foreign investment from the states to Korea should be subject to certain notification to foreign banks or the Korean ministry with regards to that investment. So any repatriation should be subject to that regulation in accordance with that rules. So it depends on uh, various scenarios, but I would say that we will be able to categorize the situations but depending upon the type of entity that will be set up in Korea. So first of all, if you set up a branch in Korea, then any earnings uh, in that branch, which is simply driven by that branch, locally without any intervention from the, the states would be subject to the income tax of 10% in Korea and also, re, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, VAT of 10%. So any uh, repatriation of earnings back to the states from the branch would, would not be subject to any additional taxes in general, uh, which is also depending upon several exceptions, but in general, those are the rules for the branch. And in cases of the joint stock companies, we would need to consider about the dividend taxes because so, you know, in, they are complete separate entity from the state's entity, whereby their incomes, their businesses, their earnings would be subject to uh, the local tax scheme. And once they are subject to the VAT of Korea, any, any dividends that should be repatriated to the back to states should be also subject to the dividend taxes. So there would be double taxations in that regard. So uh, you would need to um, consider that kind of taxation system before you enter into the Korea and to especially decide which kind of entity you'd like to set up in Korea. Uh, and if I may? What, are, what is the withholding on, on those dividends? Do you, do you right. have to know? Um, you know, what happens is uh, in Korea, so if you were to have a local entity in Korea, there should be a Korean uh, tax resident company. Therefore, the company will be subject to Korean income tax. Uh, on the average is about 22%. So 20% being a national tax, 2% being a local tax. And after paying corporate tax as a shareholder, let's say, assuming that you do have a 100% on a subsidiary, right? If you want to have a distribution, right? And then if you want to uh, send this dividend back to the states, then there's going to be withholding tax of about 20% national tax and 2% local tax, right? But by the US and Korea tax treaty in place, right? Pursuant to which uh, the rate would be reduced to uh, 10 to 15%. 
So 10% being a corporation and 15% being a individual. That's wonderful, Sonny. Thank you very much. So to emphasize that there are benefits of the US-Korea tax treaty that right. reduce the withholding obligation on the repatriation of funds back to the United States. Totally. And we can't, we can't emphasize enough to our US friends here um, how important that is and how helpful that is. It, it makes Korea a very attractive jurisdiction because you know, the market is as vibrant as it is. And while it's not a tax haven, it's certainly not one of the more highly taxed uh, jurisdictions around the world. So when you, when you think about it on balance, it's, it's a pretty good deal. Um, what I'd like to do is try to uh, uh, reserve a few minutes uh, for any Q&A uh, that people in, in, in the audience might have. Um, but first, I'd like to uh, turn this discussion over to Ms. Ellen Meinhardt. Um, Ellen is uh, the International Trade Manager uh, for the Virginia Economic Development Partnership, uh, which is a, a, an offshoot of the uh, state or the Commonwealth, excuse me, the Commonwealth of Virginia. And uh, Ellen, perhaps you could uh, tell us a little bit about what you and your program uh, do uh, for US concerns looking to go uh, overseas. Gladly, David. Good morning, good evening, everyone. Um, I, I hope that everybody has learned that there are a ton of resources and people to help you successfully enter the, Kore the Korean market. And if you're a Virginia company, I am one of those the resources for you. So I will put my contact information in the chat box. If you are if you are interested in pursuing Korea, please please reach out to me, and we will figure out all everything that you can take advantage from the states, including a lot of grants that will pay for these lawyers and bankers and foreign exchange and all these things, reimburse these expenses that come with um, pursuing international markets. I led our Korea trade mission in 2017, and because there are a ton of defense companies and security companies in um, Virginia, they have had a lot of success in Korea. Korea is a really important ally to the United States and their defense security systems are based on American standards. Um, so that is a, a very good market. Um, Korea is a great market for defense and security companies. We've also, because of the technical prowess of Korea, our cyber companies, um, medical equipment, and education companies have also have also done well there. If you are pursuing, if you are a Virginia company or if you're just have a, a big presence in Virginia, I encourage you, and if you're interested in Korea, please come and um, participate in our Korea trade mission this year. It's taking place from November 8th through 12th. The registration deadline is September 10th. If you've never participated in a trade mission, let me tell you quickly what it is. Essentially, it's a week's worth of customized meetings. We have worked for the past eight years with a Korean business development firm. And what basically what they'll do is you sign up for the trade mission. They will work with you to figure out who you wanna meet, be that partners or end users, and they will do all the outreach on your behalf. So essentially you just fly into Korea and all these meetings have already been set, set up for you. And I, I really mean it's, it's that easy. So it is going to save you a ton of time and money, just like they've been saying, to find you, they will help you find those partners um, that you need to work with in Korea. And then you will have a chance to meet with them and, and um, in, in Korea. So essentially it's a $2,500 fee. It's significantly subsidized by the state of Virginia. It's going to save you a ton of time and money because these Korean business development professionals are the ones that are going to do the outreach and set up the meetings on your behalf. And what I know, I've been working this job for about six years, this, this will jumpstart your business in Korea and it will save, it, it, it will save you a ton, a ton of time and money doing that. So again, I will put my um, information in the chat box and I look forward, and I look forward to working with you and, 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 and again, encourage you to reach out to me as, um, about Korea and if you're interested in participating in our Korea trade mission. And um, I'd like to just turn it over to Joe Martin. He will wrap up our webinar. Joe is the president of the Dulles Chamber of Commerce. Joe, are you, where are you? I don't see somewhere. I heard him. 
He was on. Jan, you want to wrap it up or do you want me to? Yeah, talk? let me wrap it up. It looks like Joe had to leave at 9.30. So uh, then allow me being the chair of the DRCC IBC Council to wrap this up. I want to thank both the chamber as well as Holland and Knight, and in particular you, David, uh, as moderator, as well as all the panelists for this exciting uh, event. I assume, Cam, that the recording and, and slides and contact information will become available for all uh, who participated today. And with that, uh, I wish everybody uh, a safe summer, and hopefully we will see each other uh, either in Korea or here and at the East Coast. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jan. And I want to uh, uh, especially recognize Kamira uh, Salu, uh, my colleague here at Holland and Knight. Uh, Kamira uh, organized uh, all of this from a, a behind the scenes perspective. We would never have been able to pull this off, but for Cam. So Cam, thank you very, very much. Um, my deep thanks go to Sonny uh, and his law firm and all of his colleagues who have been uh, wonderful presenters today. Sonny reached out and invited people like Justin and Joel uh, to join our panel. And Joel and Justin, you provided uh, exceptional insight uh, today. And I want to thank you both very, very much. Um, if anyone has any questions after the webinar, feel free to reach out to us here at Holland and Knight. We'd be very happy to get you in touch uh, with the right people. With that, uh, thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Hey, everyone. Justin, you've got some questions. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, are they in the chat? Yeah, on the chat, yes. Um. Okay, so um, ask, your, okay. ask your question. Yes, I'm going to ask you because I put it on the chat and I'm going to ask that question here. I just wanted him to briefly explain our, you know, the verticals opportunities available for the uh, American markets, American companies in uh, Korean um, uh, markets, which verticals are horizontal. Uh, since he's an experience, he opened a lot of businesses in Philippines and other places. So I'm more interested in finding out uh, which markets are more lucrative or has more opportunities over there. And mm. uh, with that, for, with uh, I know Ellen is there and I don't know where we're ending of this. Uh, Ellen, I've, uh, I'm going to email it to you about what you mentioned. Um, and if you can send me some information on that. Uh, send me your contact info, Nasir, we'll talk. Thank you. So, um, Nasha, just to quickly answer your question, I think everybody is looking to jump off. Alternatively, if I didn't finish answering it, just reach out to me. I'll drop my email. You can you can easily get that. Uh, I think if you're looking for certain kind of opportunities in terms of career, uh, very much in technology, like I mentioned, uh, even the government is going towards that direction. Uh, link up with the Invest Career, you can clearly see there are certain industries, certain segments that they are strongly pushing for, right? Um, really, I think the logistics is very huge, right? Um, if you are able to come in something in that area, that's going to be awesome in meaning technology to support logistics. Yeah, I would say that would be, that would be a very interesting market to look into. Um, anything that's very high tech, right? In, into technology and, and Korea is very strongly pushing that. You know, they are pushing 5G, uh, everything li links up really fast here. And if you are into technology and you are able to present um, the local market, you're going to get a lot of buy-in. You're going to get a lot of potential investors. I would say that would be market to look into just really quickly. Yeah, I Hope agree. I'm, I'm just going to say I, I agree. If, we have, if you have something extremely high tech, they are. we've gotten a lot of attention from the Kore Koreans and uh, um, doing R&D and different things to figure out how that they can come, you know, it in their in their different industries so i agree with that yep Nasir, I, ho I hope i answer your question uh, yes thank you really appreciate it okay. yep so thanks everyone <laughs> hi everybody and, uh, yeah, justin, if you <laughs> can uh, hi, everybody. Uh, sorry uh, justin if you can leave your contact information in the chat box if possible 
sure thing, sure thing. I'll just drop in the chat. No worries. Thank you all. Okay, all of you, good morning. Good morning, guys. Good, good night. Thank you guys so much for good joining. Good night, Justin. Yeah. Yeah. Good night, Sunny.